Welcome and aloha. Thanks for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. Wherever you may be, good afternoon, good evening, and good day. <clears throat> we have the good fortune today of having with us retired Judge Sandra Sims back from a wonderful mainland trip where she took in a number of historically important places in our civil rights history. <clears throat> we have David Larson, who's just finished a year as the chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, and who was July's Distinguished Panelist of the Month for Think Tech. <laughs> and Tina Patterson, who with David, was part of one of the shows of the week on trauma, yes. encountering it, dealing with it, getting through it, and recovering from it. So lots of things to work with. One of the things that is in front of all of us in these times, that we're confronted with lots of choices and a lot of those choices involve conflicts. And so if you think about which of the choices confronting you in your life involves conflict in ways that you have to deal with. Hey, Judge Sims, you want to start us off? What's something you're having to deal with or have had to deal with that's involved some conflict in those choices? Well, you had, you alluded earlier to the, the trip that I uh, took over the summer to some places in the South, which raised, which brought to mind uh, some, some really uh, concerning conflicts about you know, race and how we deal with our history uh, went to the uh, uh, Selma to Montgomery Drive and to the uh, to the equal to the uh, Equal Justice Initiative Center that, that the museum in, in Montgomery, and it raised a lot of questions and concerns for me as to how we deal with the issues of resolving, if it is possible to even resolve our uh, racial conflicts, because we can't move forward until we address the real issue. I think one of the things that was impressive about the center was the way um, uh, Stevenson said we had to begin the discussion rather than talking about uh, slavery and enslavement, to talk about kidnapping and, and murder because that's really what we were, you know, kidnapping from, from those enslaved folks from Africa. And then doing what we did with that history. And until we face that, it's gonna be hard to move. And, I, and I'm just still wrestling with that myself, just like, oh my goodness, what do we do? How do we do this? And how do we have these conversations with folks? And, and that's a really important insight because the history is not just slavery and enslavement, but human trafficking on a grand scale. They, with abduction, with murder, with all yeah. kinds of extreme levels of inhumanity. So what did seeing and come, coming face to face with that in these times mean for you? You're still talking to me, okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it's it, it's it's kind of forcing us to really have to have some of these conversations. Just recently, in fact, it was just the other day, I uh, was at a meeting and um, Crystal Kwok, who's who's a filmmaker at UH, and she's done a film called Blurring the Blurring the Color Lines, and it has to do with her Chinese family um, that lived for many years in Mississippi, um, doing a business there. And she spent time going back there, interviewing uh, the people that lived with her near her family and looking at the issues of you know, race and uh, discrimination, how it would fight in those days. This was like in the fifties. And uh, it was quite an inch and, and, and it was, we had a tough discussion with some of the folks. It was kind of hard for some people to talk about some of the things that happened to them in those times. But this is here. She's talking about, you know, anti-Asian anti, anti -Asian hate 
that's also a part of that. And so it was really, it was really quite a discussion. I think what people came away from was that we, in order to get through this, we got to keep talking about it. Tina, some thoughts, experiences? I'm going to take the thread that Sandra started a little further. Um, this is, it's, it's an ongoing conflict for me. I am an elected official and I have applicants that come before me regarding land use development. And there is ongoing conflict regarding um, existing communities, historical communities, and what happens to that land. And the narrative that we have regarding that land, whether it's recognizing that it's historical or recognizing the community that's currently present and getting their way in. So there's the challenge of being considered, um, are we considering people with disabilities? Are we considering the demographics and the social economic lifestyle of those who live in that community? Um, I have been struggling personally with the narrative of there's no such thing as gentrification in some communities. And I'm like, and wanting to use other terms, oh, it's displacement, it's gentrification. And it's okay to say gentrification, but we also, with the responsibility of saying it's gentrification, what are we going to do? And what is my responsibility in responding to those communities? I had an especially poignant email sent to me recently and the person flat out said, and I, I'm not upset, I'm the only African-American, um, the planning commission in my jurisdiction. And the person said, as a, as a black woman, what are you going to do to help me? Um, and some would say, oh, he's co-opting. But this person is also saying, I think you understand my plight. And of course, on some level, I do. You know, I, I have parents who one was a, came from a family of landowners and that land literally at one point the decision was made to sell the parcel. And I won't go into reasons why the parcel was sold, but it was sold. And another side of the family that weren't landowners and just the, you know, land is power, access to land, and land. And so, yeah, that, that, it's a struggle. And I made a decision that I would respond. So I, when constituents email me, I try to respond one, but two, to it's my responsibility to find out what, what's transpired, why, what's the, what is really going on. And sometimes it's people not understanding regulations and rules. Um, sometimes it's person understanding the regulations and rules and deciding that they don't apply, but it's, it's, it's up to me to find out and then see how I can support or educate, but also knowing that this is going, this is going to continue to happen. And I think when we, as we're looking at, as we continue to look in this space, that civil discourse can make the difference. And it does make the difference. We see it in other jurisdictions. I'm constantly looking at the work that Lonnie Schooler is doing in the Austin area. There's work that is being done in um, Oregon. There's been some work that a gentleman by, I know by the name of Mike Brown is doing in Chicago. And underlying it is that discourse. And it's not saying, oh, you know, what do you know? It's not the, oh, gentrification isn't happening. It's, you know, here's what's going to happen. And here's what we, what we can do to support. Or unfortunately, we're not going to be able to support that request, but we're going to be able to do this instead. And it's about the, the allowing the community to feel heard, to feel that their concerns have been addressed, or at least they have some type of outcome. I'm gonna pause there because I know I could go wax on about this and we haven't heard from David yet. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. David? I, I guess that's my cue. Um, so, <laughs> so a couple of things. Um, you don't have, these days, I don't think you have to look very far to find um, some conflict because we're in a period where uh, there's pretty, historical polarization, and there's a lot of conflict going on. Um, kind of a very immediate conflict I'm feeling is that, as we all know, a lot of the trigger laws regarding abortion are coming into effect right now. And um, uh, 
I'm somebody that believes women should have the right to choose what's going to happen with their bodies. So I'm sympathetic to the one in three women who within a few days will have abortion prohibited or severely restricted. And um, so I'm thinking about what could I do to assist them to do what I, to, to embrace and, and preserve what I think is a fundamental right. And the conflict I'm feeling is that some of these state laws have language that says anybody that that facilitates or assists anybody in achieving or pursuing an abortion can be criminally prosecuted. And that there's a lot of vagueness and uncertainty with that. And I'm kind of struggling with, so what if I wanted to support an organization that is going to make it possible for women to travel to Minnesota, for example, that doesn't have those kinds of restrictions, or Illinois, or New York, or California, what, what are the limitations on what I can do? Um, and what is the, the and how real is that threat? I mean, would I if I financially supported one of those organizations or volunteer time, am I really going to be prosecuted criminally in a court in Texas? Um, so I'm kind of struggling right now with with what the landscape. Um, what will I be able to do and how far will I be able to go? So that's that's one conflict I'm on a kind of a professional yeah. level. Yeah. And then uh, the the other conflict I'm struggling with a little bit is, uh, Chuck alluded to an earlier show about trauma, where I talked about a recent home invasion I had where somebody broke into our home when we were home at, at about 10 o'clock at night on a Friday night by throwing a lawn chair through the window and coming into our house. And it came into the house and we were about, at that point, about five feet away. And the, the police were on the scene and came through the broken window immediately afterwards, but then a then a brawl ensued and uh, we we're going to have to replace our kitchen floor and repaint the house and patch it and sand the living room floor uh, to overcome all this damage. Um, but fortunately, the person didn't get to us. And I live in a state which is a gorgeous state, 10, you know, 10,000 lakes, really more than 11,000, a lot of hunters, a lot of outdoors people. And uh, they're telling me that you need to get a gun. And I've, you know, I've always been uncomfortable with guns and I'm not a... You know, I think there's too many guns and people are saying, you know, this happened and, you know, op only by the grace of God. Um, Cause when, again, this person, we were five feet away when the, this guy came through the window and he was violent. Um, two officers couldn't restrain him. We waited till eventually had 14 police cars, 20 officers in our house. Um, the guy was out of control, but he wasn't able to get to us, even though he was a few feet away. So I've got friends saying, this is it. You know, you, you know, this is not hypothetical anymore. You have to get a gun. And, uh, you know, we live in an area where, where uh, we're a little bit isolated. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking about that, but I'm still, my inclination is there's got to be a, another way. I don't really want to get a gun um, just because I feel that that's inconsistent with what I preach. So I'm struggling with that a little bit and with some of my friends to say that I, you know, I know I know this happened and it was really frightening and dangerous, but I still want to think if there's an option here that's short of doing that. So on a personal level, I'm, I'm struggling with with that choice right now. Yeah. That's a tough question, David. That's a really really tough question. And uh, I know when I was on the, when I was on the bench, and Hawaii has pretty restrictive gun laws, and at that time. And I think it still is the case, you know, to get a concealed uh, weapon permit, permit was uh, quite a detailed process, but a number of judges were able to do so. And, and for a, a, a long time, you know, my husband was kind of almost insistent that I get, um, we didn't have anything happen, but that I get that concealed uh, weapons permit. I've not used a gun too, I'm with you, David, but at the same time, yeah, but what I've done, and I don't know that it would make a difference. And uh, I always have the thing in the back of my head that if I have the gun, I'd probably freak out and do something worse to not make a better situation or panic or do something that was not really responsive to the, you know, to that one-on-one -on -one situation that everybody says, yes, if you had a gun, you could do this. And I keep thinking if I had a gun, I'd probably still freak out. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I got. I mean, there's a lot of. I don't, 
There's a lot of reasons not to, because yeah. for it to make a difference, you have to have it with you all the time, basically. Because right, exactly. When I, I mean, think about what happened, there was no time to go get the gun. Right, I mean, they're happened. right in your, they're right there in your face. They're, so they're only seconds. So you, right. So you'd have to have the gun with you all the time in your home, you know, and that that's certainly problematic. Um, so I think there's a number of reasons not to do it. Kind of mm -hmm. what you were alluding to, uh, a lot of accidents happen with guns, where uh, you know. Maybe you got, got kids over at your house and God forbid that they get into the gun, but maybe they could. Um, you know, if you're keeping it close by for these emergencies, because you know, something like this could happen. Yeah. And well, that means that maybe it's accessible. And that certainly would be a concern. Um, you know, you would hope to God that you don't ever have any kind of emotional outrage or incident where your judgment's impaired and you turn to a gun um, to kind of resolve your dispute. Hopefully that would never happen to, to us, um, but it does happen to people. Yeah. And Less um, your tolerance. Yeah, if the gun's there, you know, rather than using your words or even using your fists, um, sometimes people use the gun. And that's another reason to be concerned about the presence of that weapon. Um, so yeah, I, it's a very serious decision. And one I've been thinking about ever since that break-in. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's a tough one. And so where does that take us? What, what are the conflicts that we're really weighing here? Is it between Second Amendment right to bear arms, no matter what? Is it personal safety? Is it simply the risk of having a gun that has to be both accessible and loaded on an immediate basis and available not just to you, yeah. but to anyone else who might come across it in that setting? Yeah, I, I don't see it so much as second. I'm not a, you know, against Second Amendment, and I don't necessarily view it as being an unlimited right to carry weapons at all times. There certainly are some limits that can be placed on it, and their limits are, and I'm okay with that. I think for sometimes for, for folks like me, it kind of the conflict is not so much the Second Amendment as it is my personal views about uh, gun ownership and, and the, the the dangers of having a gun in, in certain settings and my sort of personal philosophy about that. I think that may be more of the conflict than just I don't believe that anyone should, you know, I, that's not what I believe. People can, certainly have the right to do that. But it may conflict with some of the values that I hold, you know? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm feeling, that that internal conflict. It isn't about mm -hmm. what are the boundaries of the Second Amendment. It's about, so this is what I've been preaching my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. can, I, can I suddenly be a gun owner and still be true and consistent to what I've been preaching? Um, I'm not sure I can. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's so inconsistent with what I've always valued that even when I've experienced this, I would still, I could still justify moving in that direction. Um, and so that's what I'm struggling with. And 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 you could. I mean, I I know some folks that have actually dealt with what you're dealing with, and uh, I won't kind of publicly go and say what they've done, but that was. That was the same kind of a conflict. It's like, this is something I've not personally ever advocated. And here I am in this situation where, my goodness, I'm kind of forced to, to make the call, to make a decision. And it's not They've an made easy their decision. decision. They've made their decision. And it's a scary one. David, I agree with you. And Sandra, I agree with you. It's not an easy decision. Um, I, I've said this on this show, so I don't mind repeating it. I am a firearm owner, and it was because mm -hmm. of a member of the public um, deciding that my personal time was the time for them to vent. Um, mm -hmm. And I have not, prior to that, I was not in favor of people. I thought it was fine if someone had a firearm and owned one. Um, you know, of course, there's great responsibility. And as you indicated, David, you know, having the gun locked up or having access. When I got my, when I underwent my training and I got my license, um, Maryland had a 
uh, did not allow for concealed carry except for under special circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understood that my firearm was primarily for self-defense. And as you indicated, David, if someone broke in, you know, are, is that gun going to be by you? And, you know, is it going to, or is it locked up in a safe? And, and thinking about all that, or if someone were to visit and they happened upon it, you know, you know, what would I do? But also traveling. And I, I have friends, I have colleagues that they're not, they are in um, concealed carry permissible states. And one person in particular has told me, you know, I have my firearm in my, my vehicle. Can't do that in Maryland. But the Supreme Court ruling recently has changed all of that. And so mm -hmm. now it's a matter of, um, you know, we've got um, our public safety saying, you know, the the floodgates can now open for people who previously couldn't get a concealed carry permit mm -hmm. to now get it. And I have to ask myself, do I really want it? Do I really need it? Because it, it, it changes, it completely changes the narrative. Oh, it's yeah. not just home oh, yeah. self-defense. It's as you indicated, both of you indicated, do I want to carry this with me and have this, this firearm with me in my car? And of course, you know, the, the ammunition is supposed to be in one compartment and the firearm. And, yeah, they're not, they're not supposed to be together. <laughs> they're not supposed to be together. Um, but it, it opens all of that, that, that conversation. And right now I've been, you know, I've had friends texting me, what are you going to do? I'm not doing anything. I need to mull this over because it now that level of that, 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 that level of liability has so significantly increased. Um, if I were to move forward with a concealed carry. So I definitely understand what you're saying, David. And I, I, I applaud you for being true to who you are and, mm -hmm. and how you feel. And if your answer ends up being no, be okay with it. And if your answer be, is end up yes, you know, that's your, that, that decision is ultimately yours. And, you know, if people give you a hard time about it, that's on them. And I, I like that idea of, that that expression or characterization of mulling, mulling it over when it's a difficult decision and kind of expanding this whole idea of impossible problems or intractable problems, trying to reach solutions. Um, I was actually reading some articles about neuroscience and making the distinction between prefrontal cortex reasoning, which is when, when you focus and you, you plan and use kind of your executive mind, um, that sometimes you keep going back to that and you feel like you can't reach a solution. Mm -hmm. And I was reading from an article by a physician, Alison Escalante, who was saying that, well, back right at the turn of this century, uh, Washington University School of Medicine identified the um, the fault mode network in our brain um, that actually doesn't engage until you're at rest. And that's the creative part of your brain in contrast mm -hmm. to the prefrontal cortex. and that sometimes when you have difficult decisions what you need to do is 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 step back from it and um mm -hmm. and engage this other part of your brain the more creative part of your brain and uh the suggestions are you know do things like uh step away from the problem and just start doing an automatic task like uh driving your car on a route you are familiar with or fold laundry or just do something to turn your immediate mind away from the, the practical tax and and you might engage this other default mode network of your brain and uh, suggesting that daydream and daydream is different than than meditation that meditation yes. can be kind of focused or saying no don't do that it's just let your mind wander um you know even if you fall asleep that's okay because that part of your brain can engage when you're sleeping so uh, you know, as i'm thinking about difficult decisions i'm I think about that too, that um, maybe my default mode network will help me out uh, with coming up with a kind of creative solution. And we see that a lot in our yeah. work, yeah. in your judge work, in your conflict resolution work, the thinking fast, thinking slow, Daniel Kahneman, the wonderful archetype that he set forth there. Yeah. How do you make that work for you that thinking slow the more complex decision making yeah he when you raise that david about doing it that going into that approach is this is a distinction to be, be made between the decisions the tough decisions that we have to make on a personal level 
and those that we do on a professional level. And I think there's a whole different exercise uh, at play, even in tough professional decisions. We have a process for that. And it's that way of, it's detachment. It's what we get. We're able to do that, particularly as, you know, with legal training, that's a part of it. But when it becomes personal, so intensely personal, what David is talking about, that's, that's where the, <laughs> that's where the hard, I mean, that really is, I don't know. I don't have an answer. As in, there's an exercise, that's an exercise that you can engage in. I don't know if it'll get you the answer you need. Will it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, one thing in terms of you know what can you do, I as I reflect on decisions and moments in my life previously, I know this has happened. I I I can think of instances where I've left an issue, and I'm doing something else because I couldn't think of an answer, and something like pops into my brain um, when I'm not focusing on the the issue that that's at hand. So one thing I'm thinking about is can I can I be proactive by engaging this restful part of my brain? Um, can I be conscious about carving out space where that part of my brain can be activated? Um, and again, that, that's the idea is that I'm not going to focus it and concentrate it. I'm just going to free it up. Uh, but it, it can, I can be proactive in providing opportunities for that to happen. And I'm not sure I've been very good at that in the past although i think it's happened kind of organically and it's led me to some good yeah yeah but maybe thinking about how i can carve out space for for that to happen well that's a great place for us to wind up in our last minute any final thoughts on what works best for you to make a really careful deliberative decision in a tough choice situation tina I love the term of the default mode network um, brain because I, I I have utilized it and not known it. It's the it's the moment in the garden where I'm um, deadheading my roses and all of a sudden the problem has been resolved. Um, sometimes it's um, I, you know I've got a client who's asked me a question and I'm trying to resolve it and as I'm you know pulling out the mixer or I'm putting the vacuum cleaner away, all of a sudden the pieces come together. Now there's also the other side of it where the default network brain, as David mentioned, kicks in at 3 a.m. in the morning um, and reminding myself to remember it when it's time to actually get up. But I, I agree with you, David. And sometimes it's not a concerted, focused effort. It just happens. Um, you know, people, you hear people often say, oh, my, this idea came to me in the shower. And it, it's the answer that they've been to the question they've been mulling over. So I, I, I'm glad to know there's a term for it. And I have utilized it and I hope to utilize it in the future. I agree. I didn't know there was a term either. So yeah, <laughs> you get to do that. So well, you know, one, one thing that's helped me is that um, what we haven't mentioned is community. Um, when I've had a difficult decision to reach out to a community I trust could be familial, could be friends. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But but that kind of outreach has, has helped me with difficult decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's I'm a great thought here. to kind of wind us up here today. Folks, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Hopefully these thoughts on conflicts, how to reason through them, tough choices, and how to make them will be of some help to you. Come back and join us in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.